Hello and welcome everyone to another open air training webinar. Today we will focus on the Horizon Europe open science requirements in, in practice. And we have with us today, Jonathan England, our training specialist and also our invited speaker, speaker Victoria Tsukala, open science policy officer at the European Commission. So uh, welcome. And before we start, I would like to quickly go over some housekeeping notes for our webinar today. So this, uh, this session will be recorded and we will make the recording publicly available for everyone after the end of this session. If you have any questions, please make sure to post this in the Q&A section of this uh, Zoom webinar and our panelists will address them at the end of the presentations. Um, you can also check what other participants have asked and upvote uh, your uh, preferred questions so this will get answered quickly. Uh, if we fail to answer all of your questions by the end of this session, then we'll, we will make sure to carry them forward and answer them in a blog post afterwards. So you can find the link to the slide deck uh, in this slide right here, and you can also scan uh, the QR code so you can be redirected to the presentations. So uh, with this, again, a warm welcome uh, to our speakers, and I would like to pass the floor now to Jonathan to kickstart the webinar with a, with their introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Athene. Welcome, everyone. And uh, let me just share my screen. And, oops. OK, so um, hello, everyone. So today we are going to talk about the different requirements for uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, during and after the, the, the end of the project. Um, we will go over some um, definitions also, but I will also go over the grant proposal, the open science element in the grant proposal at the, uh, at the end of the, uh, the presentation. Um, so you will, uh, you already have access to, to the slides. If you follow on, on the bottom of your screen, you, you will see the, uh, the link. Um, on this first slide, basically, the, it's all the different links to the official documentation, as well as some of um, OpenS pages, um, Q and A's from previous uh, webinars, and other guides. So the first thing I want to to mention is that uh, in terms of the European Commission, open science is more or less the same definition as you see um, everywhere else. Um, and the key principles that they highlight are um, more or less the same, open access to publications, um, the uh, data management following the FAIR principles. If you were um, a grantee of uh, Horizon 2020, you will know about this, um, this expression of um, opening data as openly as possible, as close as necessary. This is still um, uh, valid. Um, one thing that I will highlight that is uh, really present now in, in the guidelines from the European Commission is uh, that you need to add any information about any outputs, any tools, instruments to, that are needed to validate or reuse the results and the data. And that you obviously need to um, have the, either the digital or the physical access of the results uh, available uh, to validate the conclusions. So we'll first start with the, the publications. So if it's quite different from um, if you were used to Horizon 2020, there's quite a few uh, differences. You still need to um, make a, a version of your manuscript available in open access on a trusted repository. I will go into the definition of what a trusted repository mean but at least one of the, the, the versions of your manuscript on, on a repository. The biggest difference with Horizon 2020 is now you're not allowed an, uh, an embargo anymore. So you need to have this, uh, this version on a repository with immediate open access. The biggest difference also is that this version that you upload on a repository needs to be licensed under an open license, a Creative Commons attribution license, also called CC BY license. Um, and by definition, this allows you basically to retain your rights as authors and to um, make it available on a repository without having to ask the, uh, the publisher. As I mentioned before, 
information about research outputs or tools instruments to validate the, the, the results of the publication is really emphasized by the European Commission. So that's something that you really want to also include in, in any of the outputs that you have. A small reminder also that the uh, to never forget to add the acronym and the code of the project within the publication itself. A few um, specificities for uh, Horizon Europe grants is that publication fees are reimbursable, so you, you can include them and you should include them in your grant proposal. Uh, but only if the venue is full open access. So as you as you might know, um, there are some uh, publication venues that we call hybrids um, uh, open access, where basically it's um, um, you have to to pay uh, for for reading uh, some of parts of the uh, of the journal, but they they give you that option to um, to pay for open access. So this hybrid model, hybrid business model, you are allowed. And this is important. You, there's no restrictions where you you can publish. So you you are allowed to publish wherever you want, but only. Um, open access fees are reimbursable if they're full open access. So hybrid journals, we, you wouldn't need to find the funds for paying those article processing processing charges in a from a different uh, in a different way. Uh, if you're in humanities or social sciences, just uh, so you know, long term formats so monographs and 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 similar um, work can be a slightly different. Uh, a more restricted uh, um, license. So in case you're not familiar with the um, new vocabulary of how the different versions of a manuscript are called, they were before called uh, preprint, postprint, and public publisher's version. And uh, now they, they're called preprint, author accepted manuscript, which is what I call the ugly version of your manuscript, basically where it's this, it's the peer reviewed uh, version. So the final version, so the content is the same, is just not uh, edited by the by the publisher. So it, it looks uh, um, unedited basically. So this is the author accepted manuscript and uh, you need to at least have that version on, um, on, the, on the repository under CC BY license. And the version of record is the publisher's version, so the, the copy edited version of the, so the content is the same as the author accepted manuscript, but it's copy edited. And this one can be uh, under a different license as the author accepted manuscript. So one thing I want to, to mention linked to what I just said about having different licenses for the different versions. Um, one thing that is really important that I really want to emphasize is for you to make things uh, available in open access, you have to self-archive. So you need to deposit a version on a repository to make it openly available. And there are different ways of doing that. So obviously you can pay for uh, making uh, your, your versions available in uh, open access. But you can always uh, try the route of the rights retention strategy. So I won't go into details of this because it, it it requires a bit more explanation. But it's basically a statement that you would put during the submission process and basically telling the publisher that you're applying um, a CC BY license to all the author accepted manuscripts. Um, so if you have that in place, then you your once it gets published. Whatever the license is applied on the version of record, you can upload the um, the author accepted manuscript on on a repository. Uh, there is one or a couple of exceptions for this, and uh, Victoria will uh, talk about this. It's the uh, the European Commission's publishing platform uh, called Open Research Europe, and they have a specific um, system where they automatically um, upload your um, uh, your work on uh, on a trusted repository for you, so you don't actually need to do to do that step. But in most cases, you would need to. This is an, an exception. Okay. In terms of data, it is more or less the same as um, during um, Horizon 2020. But now, before it was um, uh, an option, now it is mandatory. So 
you need to follow the FAIR principles. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into details because this requires um, a bit more explanation. I will go over just um, briefly over each letters, what they, they stand for. Um, but if you're not aware of what they are, I would highly suggest to look more in, into, into them, especially because now you need to write what we call a data management plan by month six um, and update it before the, the end of the project. So now you need to deposit both the uh, metadata, so that's the data basically describing all the this field describing the data, so like the author's name, the date of deposit and all that. Um, you need to deposit that metadata and all the data itself as soon as possible, so as soon as it's been produced, generated, or after any quality um, checks, uh, you will need to deposit it. Again, you need to deposit in a trusted repository. I will explain what the definition of a trusted repository is for the European Commission. And following this guidelines that I mentioned before, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, which means that data can be closed, that's not an issue, but the metadata, so those fields that are describing basically your data, uh, must be deposited on a repository, they must be following the FAIR principles, and they must be deposited under a CC0 license, which is similar to a public domain license. Uh, your data um, needs to be deposited either in a Creative Commons attribution license or um, a CC0 license. I highly recommend, for different reasons, I can go into more details during the Q&A if you want, I highly recommend for data to always use the CC0 license. There are some reasons behind this um, from um, a building knowledge point of view. Um, it is uh, It avoids some of those issues that can come with uh, um, more closed uh, licenses. And again, something that I mentioned before and the European Commission does insist that is new to Horizon Europe is the detailed information about research outputs, instruments to validate the, the data. So there are obviously some um, valid justifications that exist to, to not opening your data. And I want to emphasize that the European Commission is very clear that, uh, for instance, if you have commercially valuable uh, data that you could exploit, uh, and use uh, for um, in, and apply intellectual property rights and um, gain um, commercial value from it, you should definitely go that route. So you should never uh, undermine your um, its, uh, its exploitation. Obviously, data protection, privacy rules apply. That's also under GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation for um, uh, personal data. And also, if you have security um, data, then obviously that you will not be sharing either. So, as I said, a few definitions about some of the elements I, I mentioned. Trusted repositories has, uh, if you go on the, the official guidelines, you will see this. It's kind of a copy paste of what they, they say. Uh, it's a lot of technical things. What I would say is basically, select a repository that either in your community and your research community is used by a lot of people that uh, a lot of people tend to to use um that is endorsed by by your community uh, or use an institutional repository then you should definitely go that route to check for those so you can go if you're looking for um repository for publication you can look on open door and for data you can go on re3 data and if that doesn't exist in, in your field, that's okay. You can always go for generic um, uh, repositories such as Zenodo that is available to, to everyone. Creative Commons licenses are open licenses. The, the one thing I want to emphasize is that they are still licenses, so they are protecting your rights as um, authors. As uh, they, they, They're not removing all your rights as um, your, your copyrights, basically. They are there to tell people uh, what they can and cannot do with your data, with your publications, uh, but they are still legally bind. So if someone is reusing your work and it's on the CC BY license without citing you, 
then you can definitely take um, legal actions if you if you wanted to. So um, you are not waiving all of your your rights by by doing that. CC0 is slightly different because yes, in this case, it's very similar to public domain where they don't even have to cite you if, even though it's a best practice, obviously it's not uh, required from a legal point of view. So I mentioned the data management plan. If you've never heard about that, uh, it's a document that is written at the beginning of, uh, of a project that is basically going to describe what you're going to do with uh, the data, how you're going to process it during the project, and how you're going to share it uh, during and after the, the project. So it's, for instance, data loss, this kind of things, who is going to, to uh, deal with the data? If you have any privacy issues, who's going to ensure that um, there's no data breach or how are you going to share? Um, are you going to use things like Dropbox, uh, which are a commercial uh, um, company, or are you going to use an, another type of tool to share between um, projects um, from the different partners in, in the project. So all this kind of uh, information uh, is um, gathered in this document called the data management plan. It's a living document, so you shouldn't see it as, okay, I write it once and then that's done. It's really as soon as you you write it and you make modifications to how you're going to process the data. There's someone new doing the added to the project, or you realize there's a better way of storing the data. Then you just uh, update the the, DM, the DMP. There's no the issue with writing the DMP is there's no clear right and wrong answer. It's really as long as you justify why you're doing. Uh, you're using this uh, tool rather than another, or why you're using this. Uh, closed um, file format rather than an open file format um, because maybe it's used widely by your community. That's perfectly fine as long as you justify everything. Um, basically, what I say about DMP is to prove to funders that you as researchers, you know what you're doing and you're not just um, using the money for um, inefficiently. Um, and yes, obviously you need to mention which of the data you're going to share or not following those, the principle as, as open as possible, as close as necessary. So I mentioned the FAIR principles. So the FAIR principles is findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. So findability is all about having what's called a persistent identifier. So you might uh, see on this uh, slide, for instance, there's a DOI. Uh, this actually, this specific DOI goes to um, the, the on, on Zenodo, and it's a slide that basically always goes to the latest version of this talk, because we give this webinar three times a year, uh, it will go always to the latest one. So that's, there's uh, this uh, question of, um, of versioning also that is interesting. Uh, you might have also an ORCID ID. Um, and it's all about uh, your data being or your publication being um, discoverable online. Accessibility is basically not having on um, a statement saying that uh, the data is available if you you want to um, by contacting the author because what happens is if something happens to that author and they can't give you access, then that data is closed forever. So it's about putting it on a repository, basically. Interoperability is uh, basically about creating, making sure that everyone can open your data even in 10 years time. So having preferably open file formats, standardizing the way that uh, you, um, you format your, your data. And reusability is about having a clear license and also having a clear readme file that allows people to without contacting you know what you did how you collected it and how to interpret the, the data um just uh, a mention about the data availability statement is something that is quite common for for funders um but as i said linked to to those fair principles you shouldn't just say um 
you can refer to one of the authors if you want to have access to the data because that wouldn't be following the the fair principles so do you think about that and that's linked to what you do in in the dmp and where you publish your data on uh, on a repository so there are a few specific cases i want to to mention especially um, um because of uh, the covid uh, pandemic um all those all the things I mentioned up to now can be uh, overridden uh, under a public emergency uh, from the European Commission, where basically it would change in the sense that you need to give immediate open access to both publication and data without embargo. And um, basically, it's really immediate open access to really um, make sure that the data is available to all researchers in the world to really um, um, fasten the, um, the the process of, uh, of research. Um, one thing also that is important to know is that if you have very restrictive uh, data you can um, that you can close, you still need to um, make it available on request by specific people. So to check that the data linked to your publication is valid, you might need to give access to specific experts for a limited number of time, so to validate the, the, find, the findings. So I'm going to mention a few uh, tools that uh, are mostly developed actually by, by Open Air. Um, I, I forgot to mention, but Open Air is a non-for-profit organization. We have both the um, human infrastructure, which is what I do as, as trainings and, and the such. And then we have a lot of um, technical infrastructure, actually, um, such as Zenodo, for instance, which is a, a repository that is uh, free for everyone to, to upload them. But we're always trying to improve on, on uh, what exists as, as tools to improve your um, the way that um, research is done. So OpenAI Expo is a very um, important tool that, uh, if you don't know about, uh, can be very useful. It's um, it's a basically such as uh, similar to a search engine that gather a lot of different data sets that connect them uh, between each other. So you can search for publication, you can search for data, organizations, softwares, uh, grants, organizations. So your um, Horizon Europe grant will be listed there. You can click on it and actually have an overview of all the publications that have been uh, published under that project, all the people, all the uh, data, softwares, all the other research outputs are linked. Everything will be linked uh, to that. You can, I mentioned Open Door and Restry Data. You can also search uh, for uh, repositories uh, directly on Open uh, on Explore. Um, and there's a lot of different statistics also that you can uh, can have a look um, at um, on that. And obviously, it's a search engine, so you can search by different um, topics. Amnesia is if you're dealing with personal data, it can be quite useful if you anonymize completely the data. So um, if you anonymize completely the data, it's you don't fall under GDPR rules anymore, so it's much easier to to share. Um, and so it's a tool that you can download to basically uh, do this um, anonymization uh, process on on your data. Argus is one of the tools. There's several other tools that you can write. Obviously, you're free to use whatever you could write in a in a word document or use one of those different tools to write your DMP. But Argos is um, one that um, is really trying to help in the process of, of the writing. Um, so it has different um, elements to it, such as uh, it attributes uh, persons and identifiers, which means that you can uh, publish it also, and it's discoverable also in OpenAI Explore. Uh, it has different versions and it has a, a different uh, way of uh, establishing the DMP, which is a bit different from other um, DMP tools. So do have a look at it and uh, and see if it suits your, your needs. And if you have any questions, there's um, um, every, every month a, a community call for any questions that you may have linked to that. 
So I want to mention uh, a couple of things about the reporting and monitoring. Obviously, this is more towards the uh, midterm and uh, at the end of the projects, but there's a couple of things that I want to, to, to highlight in this. Um, so yes, basically, as you know, the the the, the monitoring is doing by is done by project officers and, and reviewers, and they'll be looking in terms of open science at different elements. So in terms of the uh, continuous reporting, you will have the tabs of uh, publications where you will list all your publications, and just so you know, there is actually um, a wizard that allows you to um, um, to discover any. Um, um, publication that may, might be relevant to you, that might be uh, from your project, so you can just import them automatically. You don't need to write everything uh, down. Um, so here is just for information, for for reference, uh, for the slides for you in in the future. Data sets is for for the data. Again, it has this wizard that will discover if you deposit on Zenodo, for instance, it will discover it. Uh, there's uh, two types that are a bit similar but uh, different, which is result and other results. So the results part uh, focus on the uh, content of the results, so any discoveries and theories, products, services, methods, whereas the other result is about reporting about any softwares that were created, workflows, protocols, prototypes that were created as part of the, the project. And now, um, as I mentioned before, Open Research Europe is the publishing platform for um, the European Commission. And I'll let, uh, we're really delighted to have uh, someone from the European Commission to, to, to present. So I'll let uh, Victoria take over and present that. Hi, Jonathan, many thanks for, for this. Let me share my screen and thank you for the very detailed uh, uh, presentation that you gave on, uh, whoops. Uh, do you see my screen? No, not, no, not yet. Not yet. Okay, that's probably because I'm not sharing. That's why. <laughs> so now that I will share, you will be able to see it. Yes? Yes, now we... Okay. <laughs> Let's see how I can hide this uh, video panel. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, okay, you you don't see something in the center. No. Or, okay, great, great. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, no, it's very fine. Okay, thank you. So very glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me and having the opportunity to speak to so many of you on Open Research uh, uh, Europe. I gladly heard uh, the in-depth presentation you gave, Jonathan. Bravo! <laughs> thank you to Open Air for for doing uh, this work. It's very essential. Um, that uh, potential proposers and of course uh, staff that uh, also support them in this uh, uh, effort or whether you have grants, beneficiaries uh, know about these things. So what is ORE Open Research Europe? It is a publishing platform, a peer review publishing platform. Um, as you will see, it's not, uh, it's not a repository. It is for you, for our uh, beneficiaries of Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, including also Euratom and cost actions. And it's an optional service. Of course, it's offered to you as a possibility to publish uh, um, and have your research reviews at no cost to you during and after the end of your projects for up to five years. It publishes original research. That means that it uh, it should not be have been reviewed somewhere else. Like so, it's the first uh, time it's submitted for review, and it must be funded at least stemming um, from a horizon. Um, from a Horizon project um, that is uh, current or has, has finished. Um, I should also have to say in advance that as of uh, mid-2024, we're opening it up to all framework programs of the European Commission uh, besides Horizon Europe, which however, of course, do not uh, produce as much um, publications, as many publications. Um, it is a very innovative model. We know of other, um, other platforms like that, supported also by funders like the Gates Foundation, the Welcome Trust platform. Uh, this one is for uh, for all um, uh, areas of research. Um, it, it offers an innovative publishing model, which is an open peer review after publication. So first, your publication takes place, as I will show later, uh, subsequent to extensive uh, pre-publication checks. 
And then an open review takes place whereby the reviewer names and the reviews are open. Um, and of course, licensed under CC BY licenses. So all articles and the reviews on the platform are licensed. Uh, the platform carries only articles and reviews, not underpinning materials. But as I will show later, you are supposed to uh, provide uh, ideally open access, for example, to data as under the principle as open as possible, as closed as necessary. It has very high scientific standards, uh, disciplinary standards, and not everything goes for all disciplines, right? There's humanities, there's engineering, there's all sorts of different disciplines that have their own guidelines subsequent to overall, uh, that follow the overall policies of the platform. And these are vetted by our scientific uh, advisory board of about 30 people who are um, renowned uh, researchers. The process itself is very, very transparent and supports transparency and reproducibility in research, really, as I will show you in detail uh, later. So it launched, it's, it's, it's a baby still, it's in cradle, it's only uh, has a life of two years and a little bit more. Uh, and now has uh, about four, four, 10 publications, 410, 415 publications in all fields. I will show you that it is organized according to, to the fields in community gateways and collections with the latter being more specialized uh, homes for specific research communities that are interested in publishing their work there. That can be projects or that can be a specific research topic that uh, gathers the interest of a community and they want their own space. Uh, so um, these uh, places inside the platform are managed by collection or gateway advisor of, of advisors of which there you see uh, th there are a lot of them and they're curated spaces essentially and people can subscribe to RSS feeds for new publications in their specific collections or gateways, for example, that you're interested in. Uh, it's uh, indexed in the many indexers, and I will show you later on, uh, most recently in uh, PubMed. Uh, it does not have a, a journal impact factor and will not uh, seek one, uh, on the one hand because it's a platform, and on the other hand because it does support our policy that um, we should mo be moving towards more qualitative metrics and article-based metrics, uh, which um, attribute the... Uh, impact scientific or other to to work to scientific work to an article for example rather than the venue that uh, that it's published um, and you may know a lot of you know that there is a a, a, a big uh, wave towards this direction policy wave uh, across Europe uh, and that includes many funders that are in the um, many of your countries, and it is something to watch in the future. Uh, so we've uh, done open, we implement Open Research Europe through procurement, and currently it's operated by 4000 Research, which is a publisher and publishing service provider, and it's actually a model that they had developed. Uh, this procurement has helped actually bring transparency and bring the prices of the services down. So for example, um, an article, uh, the article uh, fees are at 800 euros, for example, as compared to, to other uh, publishers, you know, who are um, charge, charge a lot more. Uh, it's, of course, very quickly uh, in line with our policy and our program strategy. Uh, as uh, Jonathan showed earlier, open science is very important. It's um, in the legal documents of Horizon Europe, and this is an example uh, of how we operationalize open science practices by offering you um, this platform. Uh, of course, the other thing that, uh, that it does is that it helps you comply with contractual obligations. And as Jonathan explained earlier, uh, while we endorse and we support very much open access publishing, this is not the actual requirement. And the requirement is open access uh, to your uh, author manuscript or the final manuscript through a repository and 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 um, or actually a deposits directly to Zenodo. So by also publishing in open access in this particular platform, you don't need to do anything else, and and your um your uh, your requirements will be complied with automatically because your uh, manuscript uh, or your final uh, your final publication will will be uh, available in Zenodo. Um, we also want to support non-profit open access publishing, which is, um, you know, a type of publishing uh, that exists. You, you, many of you know that your institutions already have or your country's publishing initiatives, which are 
which take place for the public good and, and usually operated by um, the institutions. This is one type of, of uh, initiative which actually also supports transparency as well as cost efficiency in publishing, as well as the empowerment of institutions to manage their own output. It is a long-term commitment by the commission. It belongs into the uh, European research area policy. And currently I want to inform you that, um, uh, we, of course we continue its funding, right? Uh, as a service, uh, we will continue throughout the, a framework program and beyond. We are discussing with national funders in the member states because there's a lot of interest to collectively support ORE financially as of 2026 and actually to make it a collectively governed uh, platform. Um, it's not going to be an expensive business as it shows and there's a lot of interest. So uh, watch out there. Um, I think it's there. you're gonna hear a lot more of it in the future um, as uh, most likely a collective uh, collectively uh, supported uh, um, initiative for 2026, where also there will be no eligibility criteria for researchers. Right now, you need to hold um, our grant and, and, and the paper needs to be a result of that grant. Uh, but in the future, uh, we plan to make it even more equitable. Uh, now it's equitable in the sense that it's very transparent and researchers don't need to pay, but in the future, it will be even more equitable because we're planning for it to have no eligibility, such eligibility criteria. So when you meet the minimum uh, guidelines, policies and requirements of the platform, then you can publish there. Uh, so for us, it's a very, uh, it's a very efficient, impactful uh, and uh, no-nonsense, stress-free uh, uh, model for our, our, our beneficiaries. Uh, as you see, it offers rigorous open peer review. It's rapid and transparent. It is supported um, by a scientific international board that oversees policies and guidelines and important decision. Uh, it lends, helps your um, research be more impactful through immediate open access, article level metrics, as well as of course, open data for reproducibility and reuse. Plus, of course, you have no fees and there is no administrative burden to you. You comply automatically. Um, as well as, it's, of course, I will reiterate again, it's optional. We will never ever make you publish there. We encourage you, but we don't make you. Um, quickly to go through the project, the model, I'm sorry, what I said earlier, uh, is this uh, in a graphic way, an author submits an article which is published and the underpinning data is deposited in a trusted repository. However, before this publication stage, you have the pre-publication checks, which actually it's a stage of its own, and we plan to, to edit this, uh, this graphic design. Look at how extensive those checks are. So this is not a, a plain preprint, right? It is actually a publication, albeit not peer review at this stage. It goes through plagiarism checks, through eligibility criteria. Uh, ethical approvals are requested when these are necessary. Um, the editors, the in-house editors, check to see if the policies are adhered to and the guidelines are adhered to. If it's written in language that, uh, you know, that is uh, understandable and your arguments are clearly understood. Uh, if your data is available uh, in principle, in default, openly. And again, if there are specific reasons and these are explained in, in Horizon Europe uh, and analytically in the uh, annotated grant agreement, of course, they can be closed, but in principle, they have to be open. Uh, and are the methods solid? So once all of this has taken place, then it can be published and sent to peer review. Uh, this is an author-led process. The author gives five reviewer names. Um, the editorial team checks them and sees that uh, they are uh, appropriate. And of course, that there is no conflict of interest, right? Uh, they go quite through quite thorough checks. And the reviewer uh, writing a qualitative peer review and also answering specific questions. And these are also uh, have to do with the specific uh, areas, right? Not everything is the same for all areas and fields of, uh, of uh, science. It can be approved, approved with reservation or not approved. Uh, and then the article can be revised. The revisions, of course, are required. A new version sent over. And then once it has either passed through uh, two OKs or one OK and two approved with reservation, it is considered as having passed peer review and can be sent, uh, is sent to all these uh, or some, depending if they're disciplinary index into all those indexers. So 
you see that there's Scopus, there's PubMed, InSpec for engineering, Open Alex, RI Plus, Plus for SSH, Dimensions, uh, Top Factor and DOAJ, which are horizontal actually indexers, Reaxis, and of course, Google Scholar. And of course, it's sent to Zenodo. And work is now also done with national repositories, for example, to start with HAL in France, to be able to send also to, uh, to such a repositories uh, the relevant research. Um, of course, uh, the papers are, uh, the data, also, the papers are very well marked, like you cannot miss, and I will show you examples of papers, whether a paper is peer reviewed, not peer reviewed, passed or not passed, and with DOIs for uh, versions, right? And DOIs, of course, also for the peer reviews. Uh, it's quite, quite important. I mean, this model is very transparent and uh, supports reproducibility and transparency of research. Open data is very, very important for this platform. So um, editors help you to prepare your data for sharing. There's a lot of guidelines also uh, to select a repository, to da add a data availability statement in your article, and then link your data sets to your article. That's quite, quite an important uh, part and step uh, of the process that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, I have to say that most of the articles in this platform have their research data open. It's an exception that they don't. Um, there, there's a number of different articles, many different article types actually that are supported, which is great. Uh, about 50% of the articles on the platform are research articles, but the remainder are all different kinds, which actually help you publish in the duration of your research and of your, of your project. Um, as you see here, we can have review articles or study protocols, method articles, brief reports, and you can see how these correlate to the various uh, stages uh, of your research. Software articles actually quite, uh, are emerging as a quite popular article in the platform itself. Uh, so you see that, uh, that there are also, uh, there, there's possibility to publish beyond the traditional review um, research article. And I encourage you to take this, uh, this opportunity. Uh, how does the publication look like? You see here a data note, which is clearly marked as a data note, which has been revised. And here you see that this is the second version that has passed uh, through peer review with two approvals and one approval with reservations. So it is considered um, a peer reviewed uh, article. And you see here the open peer review and the approval status. You can of course read the reviews. You see the name, the names of uh, the reviewers. Um, you also see the views and the downloads and the citation of this article thus far. Um, and you see that it belongs in various gateways. Here, um, this one does not belong in a collection in particular, does not belong to a targeted uh, research community. You can side download and export the article. So there's a lot of functionalities in here. Um, another note on the peer review process is super, super rigorous, as I said to you, uh, uh, reviewers need to meet criteria um, that are suggested by authors, but of course the editorial team has to okay this. Um, and we actually find a lot of interest of authors, of researchers to review. And the reason of course is because it's the review is open and they receive credit for that. That's another positive thing, of course. As I said, there's an extensive list of questions. There is a reviewer code of contact to be followed. So it's quite, uh, quite rigorous, quite rigorous. And they're checked, of course, at the end by the editorial team. You can see here the report and you can see the author response uh, to this uh, uh, report. Thus far, it's been viewed two times and approved with uh, reservation. And of course, authors are invited to respond once the, um, uh, the serious doubts or serious issues are raised by, uh, by the uh, reviewer. Uh, it can be cited, you see here, and of course they are, they have their DOIs and CC by licenses. Uh, a win-win situation here, we also think as well, because research uh, with open peer review, reviews can be cited immediately. The research scholarly dialogue is open and transparent. The authors are empowered actually to read, to lead the open uh, review process and improve the quality of course of, um, their publications and as well as the quality of, of the review. Um, it reduces the possibility of bias, right? Everything is out in the open. So whoever has any doubts or reservations or is against what has been said can say so, as well as increasing opportunities for collaboration. 
and importantly here, giving credit for recognition to your work as a reviewer, as well as develop your career co-reviewing. We have this very nice opportunity that is given in the platform to co-review. Uh, for example, let's say a professor with their postdoc doing a, a review together, uh, where the postdoc gets uh, the credit, of course. Uh, usually this is shadow work that uh, takes place. Uh, and of course, all these uh, reviews having identifiers, as I said. So I highly recommend that you uh, you uh, you try it and you um, you you review become a reviewer for Ore. Uh, finally, of course, you see that we have a lot of uh, altmetric indicators, and you can see here on news outlets, blogs, tweets, etc. So there's various ways by which impact uh, is uh, is mentioned here, uh, social and other impact. Um, and finally, very quickly, that um, it does publish in all different areas, but it does, you, you should not think of the materials as dumped, right, in there. Uh, we make sure that it can be searched in different ways, like humanities and natural sciences, other sciences, and more detailed with gateways and collections. These are gateways that probably don't interest you as much, and uh, we'll see actually about improving uh, the front page and the search and discovery possibilities in the future in ways that uh, that are beneficial for researchers. Uh, here you see the gateways, the community gateways, which I mentioned earlier. They're still broad categories, but here the, the biggest category that we have are the collections, which are rather specialized areas, um, like mini journals, you could think of them, um, within the uh, Orem. Uh, and I think this is my final slide. There is a very uh, uh, active uh, Twitter account that we urge you to follow, um, as well as uh, scan to uh, register to receive the newsletter of Aura, and of course, to explore the very clear instructions, frequently asked questions and about uh, online. I think I may have run over my time here and I apologize for this. No worries. Thank you very uh, much, Victoria. And, uh, we handle the questions as, uh, as Jonathan would like, so. Yes, so before we go, to, so if you have any, I, I see there's already quite a few questions, but uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions for Victoria about uh, Open Research Europe or any other parts of the, the talk, please uh, put them in the in the Q&A and, and not the, the chats, but the, the Q&A. Um, yeah, so just to, to finish before the, um, the Q&A, I want to mention a few elements about the um, grant proposal writing, uh, because now there are some specific parts where you need to mention uh, open science. So there's uh, some mentions in the application form and also in the project proposal um, parts. Um, so here on this slide is just for reference also to, to for a reminder of where, where those are. Um, so. Yes, so in part A, for instance, they, they mentioned that you need to list five publications or data set software's uh, good services that are relevant. So there's a, a few um, uh, specificities about those uh, publications that you that you cite. So in terms of publication, as well as with the data we'll uh, mention in a second, there needs to be all the publications that you cite um, that are relevant for the uh, grant proposal need to be in open access, available in open access. They don't need to be published, meaning that you don't need to have paid for open access, but they need to be on a repository in open access. So. Obviously, if it's under the, the old format, there might be an embargo. You can uh, cite those, uh, um, uh, the, 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 that paper if the embargo is over, basically, and it is available on a repository in open access. As uh, Victoria mentioned, the European Commission does not uh, uh, look into the impact factor anymore. It's uh, really the the publications that you sell will only be evaluated by, by those experts uh, from a qualitative uh, point of view on how relevant they are for the grant proposal. Um, so I know there's a discrepancy between, for instance, the institutions of how there's some institutions still uh, highly value impact factor to how they, they judge you as researchers. But unfortunately, the or fortunately, the, the European Commission is uh, has moved from, from that from a so from a pure funder point of view, uh, in the grant proposals, this will uh, the impact factor will never be taken into account. And there are strict guidelines for those reviewing the, the grant proposals. 
Um, it's also highly suggested to give insights into where you're um, hoping to, to publish, whether it's Open Research Europe, it's suggested, but it's, it's not mandatory because as I mentioned before, you can publish wherever you want. Um, but if you're looking at publishing in a full open access journal, so that can give you some, uh, increase your, your score on the grant proposal. Data is quite similar to uh, the, the requirements uh, part of during the propo proposal where any data that you list needs to follow the FAIR principles. Um, they need to be deposited on repository, they need to have uh, persistent identifiers such as a DOI. Um, and so they, they really need to, the, the quality of the data deposited need to be um, high, basically it needs to follow those, uh, those FAIR principles. Um, while an official DMP a data management plan is not required at this stage, they do ask you questions that are very similar. So it's, I kind of call it a, a mini DMP because you do still have to, at the grant proposal stage, think about what type of data you're going to produce, where you're going to store them, and uh, what, how you're going to share it, what licenses you're going, who's going to take responsibility of, of, uh, uh, curating, managing all the all this data. So it's it's not a proper DMP, but you still need to uh, give some information about uh, this uh, data management um, aspects. And one of the um, uh, new elements for Horizon Europe is there's a distinct uh, web package for um, project management and a specific uh, DMP uh, as a deliverable. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, not only are other aspects of linked to open science are eligible on the budget, but I would actually highly recommend looking into those other types of open science practices like engagements of citizens, citizen science, um, and uh, crowdsourcing activities, um, things that are submitted to, uh, you don't have to do everything yourself. You can uh, have um, include data curation costs if you need to deposit on uh, store, sorry, on um, uh, have a storage space that you need to, to pay for during the, the, the project, or if you need the data steward during the project. I would actually, it's, I know you're asking for more money from that, but it is actually really highly viewed. So I would highly recommend uh, really including, if you can, those, those costs, because it also shows to the, uh, to the funder that uh, you have really put thought into how you're going to manage your, your, your project and that you're not going to try and uh, do on the go, that you really thought, okay, I'm going to collect a lot of data, so I need the data steward. So I'm going to include those uh, human costs uh, in, in my grant proposal. So it shows that you know what you're doing. And obviously don't forget about those uh, open access fees if you're uh, going to uh, publish in full open access journals that usually uh, have um, APCs attached to them. Um, so one of the, um, the things that is linked to what I said before about DMP is that there's no right or wrong answer. It's my writing tip is to be as specific as, as possible. So it's a bit like when you write a paper and you want to be as specific as, as possible. And then when it's peer reviewed, they might ask you for more information. So don't let the, don't force the project officer basically to dig for information. Um, so lay everything out. Um, even if things you're not, you're unsure about, just say it. It's better to be transparent and say, I'm still unsure about how we're going to manage this uh, part of the project. Um, that's, that's in theory fine, as long as you're transparent uh, about it. It means that you've consider the fact that you're still unsure about how that's going to be managed. Uh, one big mistake that I see, well, it's not a mistake, but one thing that I see a lot in, in DMPs or grant proposals is people start explaining what open access are, fair principles, open science. You don't need to do that. People that are reading your grant proposal or your DMP know what they, what they are. So no need to, to explain what they are. So there's a couple of special cases that I'm not going to go into details, but uh, I'm leaving it for, for, for reference. 
uh, ERC and Marie Curie um, have um, slightly different uh, open science requirements. So for instance, with ERC, there's no explicit evaluation of open science practices, but they will increase your score if you do uh, uh, address them. So um, it's slightly different in, in that sense, but addressing open science practices is always uh, a bonus in, in those uh, grounds. And for the Marie Curie, um, uh, actions, uh, there is a, a big part of uh, of um, open science in the um, in the excellence criteria part, um, and there's also a really emphasis on including training activities and career development plan that includes open science practices during the uh, during the project. So those are also things to uh, take into consideration when writing the the grant. So I mentioned mostly in this talk up to now, um, what are the um, mandatory um, open science practices, publication data, but you probably know that there's many more. I mean, open science is an umbrella term. It has many more different aspects to it. Um, so in terms of the evaluation of grant proposals, you will never be as called negatively for not addressing those uh, optional uh, open science practices. They can only increase your, your score. Not addressing the, the publication, the fair data, that yes, will, you will be penalized for, for not addressing them. But all the other types of open, um, uh, recommended open science practices can only uh, increase your score, not uh, lower it. There is a list on, on the, uh, in the template proposal, but it's, as everything because open science is an umbrella term, it's not an um, exhaustive uh, list. So here's just for reference, um, some of the different aspects that are um, considered as um, um, open science, um, recommended open science practices. So one of them, for instance, is pre-registration where you're going to publish basically uh, your um, the, the protocol of, uh, of your uh, of your study before actually doing the um, the, um, the the study, um, it gives you also um, the um, the person's identifier, meaning that you can also get uh, authorship from from that. Uh, so it's it's a practice that is uh, one more common and is one of those recommended practice. Preprints, so basically, uh, Open Research Europe works on this uh, on this concept. Well, they, they might not call it preprint, but they basically publish directly your your the non peer reviewed um, uh, article, and then it gets peer reviewed. You can also do that. Um, Archive is a good example. It's been going on for for decades. Um, but there's many more now preprint servers and sharing your 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 work uh, before peer review is also one of those recommended practices. Public engagement, uh, citizen science, um, as I said before, do try and include those um, because there's a real emphasis from the European Commission of outreach towards the the, the public. Um, so just to finalize and to before we go into the uh, the Q&A, uh, I would highly recommend that you design an open science strategy for your project, even if you've already started your, your project or any, not even Horizon Europe uh, specific, but any type of projects that you do, do uh, really sit down and think about what your uh, open science strategy is. Um, one thing also that uh, I forgot to, to mention here, but for the DMP, because it's required by month six, don't wait until the, the, the last month to, to start writing it. It takes time to get all the different actors to, uh, to review or get feedback from uh, different uh, people. So do start from month one, if, uh, if possible, to write the DMP. Um, and uh, yes, and as I mentioned before, there's, even if you, have an open science strategy, it can change. So uh, report any changes, um, provide any updates uh, for, from it and uh, discuss any of the issues you've had and solution. It's, it's not a fixed um, strategy. It evolves with the, with the project and the new developments in research in, in general. Um, so a couple of mention, as I said, uh, the, this webinar is organized uh, three times a year. So the next one will be on the 16th of November. 
Um, if you're interested in knowing more about open science, there's uh, this conference that uh, OpenAI is organizing and, and collaboration with an um, um, institution in, in Spain. Um, so called the Open Science Fair, and that will be from the 25th to the 27th of September of this year. Um, and if you're more on the training side of training others about open science, we organize twice a year this, what we call this Open Science Train the Trainer Bootcamp. Uh, so the application will start in September for the next iteration. Um, please um, uh, do register if you're interested. And um, and yes, that's more or less what I, I wanted to, to mention. And uh, now let's go for some questions. So let's have a look of what has been said. Um, uh, so. Jonathan, I think maybe yes. one thing that I can answer straightforward that will probably cover a few questions because I saw it a, a yeah. couple of times is why would, which is a very reasonable uh, question to be expected. Why would researchers want to publish in ORE when it does not have a journal impact factor? And how does this benefit their professional you know, careers? So um, at this moment, they would want, I think, to publish, to check out this very innovative publishing model for which we are getting raving reviews by, by the authors and the reviewers who are have been involved um, in publishing in ORE. Uh, either as authors or as, or as a reviewers. It's a very, very transparent, very, I mean, it's, it really is the direction to the future. However, we do acknowledge that research assessment practices and policies are not yet, yet there. So it might be that uh, your institution uh, and your department does not uh, say bravo for your professional advancement uh, unless you publish somewhere with a, an impact factor. That is a problem. So unless gradually institutions and funders and national evaluation agencies follow uh, the developments for research assessment, which the commission says the processes should be assessed themselves and re revised rather. Um, and there, there's a, a large number of organizations, including institutions and national funders that agree the, to, to this. However, there is this is, of course, a process. So this means that you are not strictly evaluated only on where you publish, or rather not mostly on where you publish, or rather actually not at all on where you publish, but rather on the merit and the impact of your work. Uh, this would mean uh, a, an assessment of broader indicators on your publications themselves rather than when these are published. So where these are published, which means that the journal impact factor would not matter. So we're moving in this direction, as Jonathan said um, earlier, by explicitly saying that we are not taking into consideration, not at all, and don't even bother putting your journal impact factor in papers that you submit to the European Commission because it's not considered a, an element of the significance of a paper, right? So it is a proxy, rather. So, and also uh, including more qualitative elements into the assessment of research of researchers, as well as, of course, of research institutions. So, so these two, this goes hand in hand with uh, how significant publishing or how you know popular publishing in ORE will, will be in the future. But uh, again, this is a process. This is where we're heading to, not just the commission, but also national funders and institutions. Of course, until then, we do understand that you may not want to send your latest hot shit, let's say, to ORE because you need to send it to another journal which is included in your you know, lists, et cetera. So we understand this. There are institutions, however, who are moving in this direction. So, so we have some research centers that we know include ORE in their list of um, you know, publishing of, of journals and platforms where you can publish and be credited for your work. And in some cases, actually, the, the problem is that researchers cannot publish because they don't have they want to publish and they cannot publish because they don't have a Horizon Europe grant. So, um, so this is this is my reasoning. So the model is very transparent. Uh, I urge you to try it uh, if you have papers that maybe you know it's not your first paper that you want to give uh, that you give to to another type of journal. But uh, uh, really, the the, the model itself has intrinsic merits of transparency that uh, we sh you should try. Um, it's fast publishing. 
you get credit for your reviews as well. I mean, there's a long list of why you need to do. The only reason why you would not do that is the impact factor, which is a very problematic way of assessing impact and excellence nowadays that needs to change. So uh, this is the short uh, answer, especially, I mean, if you're tenured, I would urge you to do that. There is no reason. I mean, if you are an advanced career researcher and not an early career researcher, actually, I mean, uh, there's no reason for you not to set an example uh, by publishing uh, in Nora and trying it out. Thanks, Victoria. And I, I think it's also important to point out that we are in a transition phase. So exactly. Th yes, unfortunately, it's difficult because some institutions are still judging on impact factor and funders are not. And so I understand that for researchers, it can be, especially early career researchers, it can yeah. be difficult. So we understand all the, your your doubts about that, but unfortunately it's, you know, we need to go away from impact factor because it's, you, you're penalized as researchers from from this way of, uh, of being uh, evaluated in any way. Um, so there's a questions about, uh, if publication present results that are related to the project's commercialization plan uh, or that are pat patentable, are authors allowed to publish under CC BY non-commercial non-derivatives non or is CC BY mandatory without exception for journal papers? Yeah, it's so I think it's important. So I'm not entirely sure what the... So are you... I think it's important to make a distinction because sometimes there's some confusion about the uh, project commercial commercialization. Wow, sorry, <laughs> project commercialization plan can affect the data, but not necessarily the, the 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 paper itself. So it's important to distinguish the paper itself that should always be under a CC BY license, at least one of the version. But that doesn't mean the data itself can be, uh, has to be under the same license. So be careful when you think about um, commercialization to distinguish between the, the, the paper and, and the data that is attached to it. It's not because you publish about some data, the, 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 the paper is only the words inside the, the paper. It's not the actual data that you're, you're licensing. So. Um, yes, so that's, someone mentions that if you publish patentable information under any license, then it's not patentable anymore. Definitely. So that's one of the elements that is really important to, to bear in mind when you're dealing with patents. Never share, even during a conference, uh, talk, talking about it would not, there's this novelty aspect to, to a patent that needs to be uh, respected. So as soon as you mention it in, a, in on a repository, on a paper, or on, during a conference, then it wouldn't be novel. So the European Commission is clear about that. If you want to make patents, you you put you file the patent, and then only you would publish. Um, um, so there's, there was um, a question. Okay, and then there's a question about long for long text formats. So. Um, what are long text formats? So long text formats are basically uh, books. So there's someone mentioning book chapters, articles. No, those are definitely not uh, long term formats. Those would be um, normal uh, formats and that would be a CC by a license to on one of the licenses. Long text format is more in the humanities where they, they write books about uh, a topic. So. Uh, a book chapter is definitely not uh, a long-term uh, format. Is there any recommendation of the percentage of Horizon Europe pro proposal budgets that should be allocated to open access and open science? I I would say, well, maybe Victoria will, will disagree on it, but I wouldn't say there is any like percentage. It's really... Think about what you need for your project in terms of uh, how many publications you're going to uh, publish, where you're thinking of publishing, then make the list, look at the uh, uh, fees that you need to, to pay for those, uh, for those uh, publishers. That would be your open access fees, for instance. Do you need storage space to store your data? Do you need a data steward? I wouldn't say there is any like percentage of budget, but you do need to take in, into consideration and you shouldn't um, 
you should not include it because you're asking for more money. I would, I, I think that by asking more money because you want to hire a data steward, for instance, for managing, is a good thing because, as I said, it would show the the, the funder the, uh, that you are you really thought about the project, that you know what is realistic, and that you want to make this project um, successful. Um, but as giving a percentage, at, no, I don't think there's uh, Victoria. I don't think there's no. No, I don't think there is. Anecdotally, there were, I think there, are, or there were some studies that estimated in the past, but I'm not sure that's even, uh, you know, yeah. it's not relevant. I think what Jonathan suggested is the best way to go about it. I agree. Um, about metadata, how should metadata be presented in case of using Zenodo as a repository, especially in the cases where data is going to be closed? Is it an independent file and how do you choose a correct metadata standard? Okay, so when you're, it, it's a bit counterintuitive, I, I, I will admit, uh, but yes, even if your data is, even if even if you're not to upload your data on uh, Zenodo, for instance, let's take uh, an example, uh, you would still need to have the metadata. It still needs to be findable. You know, those FAIR principles that I mentioned, it needs to be findable online. It doesn't need to be necessarily accessible to the wider public, but there might be some, uh, so I know some governments have some specific ways of accessing governmental data through um, where you do a um, registration process of why you want to have access. So it's a restricted uh, access. So that is uh, one way of making it accessible, but still closed. Uh, but the metadata still needs to be um, present uh, online. So yes, it could be, it's a, technically, I'm not entirely sure you can publish on Zenodo without attaching a file. So if really you didn't want to put any file, yes, you would just put a blank file, which I know is a bit weird, but again, we're in a transition phase, things are, it's something that the European Commission is asking for, uh, but is kind of new uh, compared to other funders. So there might be some changes in the future on, on how Zenodo works and allows you to upload just metadata that I don't know. Um, and for the correct metadata standard, there are definitely some, I, I can't remember the uh, name of the website, but there are some um, website that uh, collect all the different uh, metadata standards that, that exist. So you can see in your field if there are, there are some. Um, is it mandatory to deposit the DMP together with the research data in a repository? No, it's recommended by the European Commission, but it's not a mandatory uh, deposit. I would recommend doing it. If you use Argos, for instance, it will also de deposit it for you on, on Zenodo if you want to. Um, but it's all about transparency, so it's always better to, to have it available, but it's not uh, mandatory to, to have it um, uh, uh, open access. Does the European Commission have a plan to move the publishing and point acquisition system from the current uh, impact factor based one to other forms of assessment? So that's more for you, I think. Uh... Well, I mean, the idea is that, uh, yeah, of course, the Commission is not going to do it itself, but of course, it can affect uh, through uh, its policies as, as a funder and, uh, you know, collaboration with other funders and in the member states that we move away from the journal impact factor towards more uh, article-based metrics and also toward that, you know, reflect the impact scientific and other of an article or a piece of work itself, data, whatever it be, you know, software, um, that a diversity, the diversity of outputs and contributions to research are acknowledged, you know, not just publications, uh, but also that you know, we move towards also a more qualitative assessment of uh, of the work published. So overall, this is the direction, as I said earlier, yes. Um, if only no embargo period is required, does it mean that paying APCs is supported? Uh, most scientists think that it is the case and they see paying option as the only publishing option. So yes, you can publish wherever you want. 
including paying APCs. So whether it's a hybrid journal, whether it's a full open access journal, you are allowed to pay APCs um, as long as one of the, uh, so either the author accepted manuscripts or the version of record is uh, under a CC BY license. So this means, yes, you can pay. It's not the only option. As I mentioned, there's the rights retention strategy, which you can um, go what was called before uh, commonly as the green route, where you don't pay basically, but the version of record might, you might sign a copyright transfer agreement, but the author accepted manuscript is under a CC BY license. So you retain your, your author's rights. Um, the only the only difference here with the European Commission is that you can publish wherever you want. You can pay for APCs, but only full open access um, publishing platforms. You can uh, uh, request for the uh, the to cover the, the the APCs. So hybrid journals, you will need to find the funding from maybe your department, your university might have some funds dedicated to to that or from a different funder, that's up to, to you, but um, you're, you're not restricted to where um, you are allowed to, to publish, which is slightly different from some funders that are part of Coalition S, where you're not allowed to publish in um, hybrid journals anymore, under some, some um, exceptions, but normally you're, you're not. Can I add something here just to clarify on that? Um on the rights retention. So that's quite uh, important. Uh, our policy says that uh, either uh, you, the author, uh, or the institution, the beneficiary, should maintain enough rights, intellectual property rights, to provide the open access as required, which is for articles with CC BY and immediate open access and whatever else is in the grant agreement that is, uh, that is required. Um, so, uh, so you're supposed actually to maintain enough rights and ideally not transfer your rights to the publisher. Um, we also uh, make a point in the annotated grant agreement to explain to you that this requirement of your uh, grant agreement is a prior obligation to you and your institution than any publishing agreement you then come to sign with the publisher and needs to be honored. So the commission is going to be quite strict on that, uh, looking in the future at uh, the level of projects, but also at the level of institutions to see if this is complied with and if it's systematically not complied, then of course, we will move to uh, cutting money from projects. So that's uh, quite clear. So, um, and what Jonathan said earlier, uh, not all open access journals are require um, funding to, to publish. These are mostly the commercial journals, which of course the commercial publishers, which use this as a as a business model, and of course, we know that they are prevalent, for example, in life sciences, but there are other uh, publishing venues. There is, for example, Open Research Europe, which we offer to you at no cost to you. Um, so, for example, if you have a big project or you're a big research community, uh, we do urge you to, to, you know, to, to experiment and maybe create your own collections inside, uh, inside Aura, where you would publish uh, all of your outputs and not at no cost to you, basically. So, this is possible. So we would also urge you to look at the directory of open access journals where you can find more, um, you know, purely open access venues, because as, as Jonathan said, I mean, the commission will not tell you where to publish. You can publish where you want, but we will tell where the public taxpayer money will go and it will not go to venues that are hybrid. In other words, uh, publish both closed and open um, and open articles. So. And also, I think I, I wrote it in one comment, the journal checker tool, uh, you can check out. Um, we funded this through Coalition S funders, and you can put in your funder in the specific journal you want to, uh, including the Commission and Horizon Europe, you want to publish in, and then it'll tell you if it's compliant to our policy. So uh, for us, I mean, anything with immediate open access is compliant, only we will not pay for hybrid. <laughs> And, and if you were thinking of uh, publishing in a hybrid, I would um, I, I would question you, why are you publishing? Why do you want to publish in a hybrid? Is it for the, the impact factor? Because if that's the case, the commission doesn't care about the impact factor. So do you really want to publish there? I mean, because especially if you don't have the funding for that, is it really where you want to, to do you not have an alternative which is as good in terms of the, um, 
community recognition because that's I think what's most important is the community recognition uh, because obviously um, as, as much as I find all amazing but if everyone in your field publishes in this open access journal yes it might make sense to publish more there because everyone publishes there but if everyone publishes in this hybrid journal because it's impact factor then no, that that wouldn't be the the right decision to 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 do that. So, um, um, so for all, where in the process does the eight hundred euros cost apply if there's no author fees? For or it is uh, there is no author fee, so it is um it doesn't concern you. I was just trying that was wrong. With me. I was just trying to explain how much it costs for the commission. So an each article costs. To the commission 820 euros uh, and you know how much uh, most article costs cost in your disciplines but you don't have to pay this so so it's just was a piece of information it researchers and projects do not pay it's it's free to them and that's one of the benefits to them it does not come out of the project budget and, and it, it is aligned it's also a question of i'm, I'm guessing transparency and it is aligned with what the studies have shown of what an actual open access fee costs, not 10,000 like some journals are charging. That that doesn't it's make it, sense. You yeah, know. yeah, it does not make sense. And I should say here, since you mentioned it very well, that uh, where we see such charges, it's not clear that they will be uh, accepted uh, because the charges over the overall horizon rule says that it needs to be necessary and reasonable. And we don't consider this to be reasonable. So uh, beware that, I mean, if you present such charges, they will in no likelihood be rejected by your uh, financial officer. Is it allowed to have data which are sensitive, fully closed and make data available under fair conditions? So yes, I already answered that uh, before, but yes, definitely you can uh, make the, the metadata discoverable so that the people know that you're, you've created this data and can contact you. But yes, definitely if it's sensitive, you, you, you don't want to be uh, disclosing it because that would be a breach of uh, security or the, the data privacy. So yes, definitely that's uh, perfectly compatible, which is the whole uh, motto of the European Commission of as open as possible, as close as necessary. Uh, if I understand well, the all platform is a mean of publishing manuscript, but it does not involve peer review. Um, not quite. I think I spent a lot of time explaining the peer review model. So uh, it is, it is, it works like a journal. I mean, it's a, it's a venue where your research is peer reviewed. So it is, we don't call it a journal because it's bigger or it's intended to be bigger and have larger scale. It publishes in all fields, but they're separated within it. So for it's the same you do the same thing as you do in a journal let me put it this way yes so many funders globally are adopting dora uh, is this something that horizon europe will consider i think they already signature yes, yes uh, and they are yeah. as well so and quara also no? and Quara, yes we yeah. are supporters of course of dora and, and also for quara which is the coalition for the advancement of um Revising the assessment system, basically, I can't remember to now. Yeah, I can never remember the yeah. initials. Yes, but uh, we are very much uh, part of it and and support it. Yes. Yeah. So so just for the people who don't know, Dora was it, it's not the the old uh, version, but there's a, a newer initiative called Coara that um, the European Commission is a signatory, for instance. Um, what about the supplemental information for articles? It needs also to be deposited in a data repository. Usually there are tables and graphics. Yes, so you would uh, upload everything that is linked to, to uh, a publication, obviously. The, anything that is linked to the publication would be uh, linked to it. And also when you're depositing on, on a repository, you can always add more information that, that is required. If if you feel that, it, because on Zenodo, for instance, you can add more than just one file. Um, for instance, if you look at this presentation, I put the, the PDF version and also the PowerPoint uh, version. Um, so you can definitely add more information. Um, and that is also what the, the commission is asking you when they say to uh, add any other information, tools, softwares. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to, to uh, upload it with, but you, you can mention it in, in the description or links to other, to other files. 
However, we do recommend that you open access it as much as possible, yeah. right? Because we also say that if someone asks to validate your research and asks access to these materials, you should give them if uh, if they're not already open access. So, yes. So from a from a purely um, uh, technical point of view, if you were to so if you had your publication and then other type of information that you wanted to also share, but not necessarily in open access immediately, you might want to make two deposits. So one deposit where you deposit the publication that is open access. And then on Zenodo, I always refer Zenodo because it's actually quite good in terms of uh, co-referencing. You can add other links to other uh, YouTube videos or other Zenodo um, uploads. So you can definitely uh, do that so it's it's up to you also to decide if you want to separate the the different uh, uploads or if you want to upload everything in, in in one go and if everything is an open access it might be beneficial to deposit in one go if you need to restrict it for some time um but as a, as victoria said do put it in open access as uh, as soon as possible then you might want to do two different uh, uploads so that's always an, a possibility as long as you cross-reference them, basically. Um, in preparing the DMP for my project, I had a hard time def defining what counts as data. Uh -huh. In social science, particularly dis distinguishing insights from data seem hard for me as insights more often than not becomes data for the projects and are reusable. Yes, so um, I would highly recommend you do an actual uh, course. So there's uh, the CES, the uh, course that is uh, there's in mention about that. This is uh, the, the issue with this webinar. It's I can't go into details of what data are. Do an, uh, a research data management course, basically, because that would take much too much time. But um, if you're not, if you're new to writing a DMP, or if you're new to how uh, funders are asking for you to uh, manage your data. We definitely do some of the courses that are available online uh, to what are the best practices in terms of data management. Um, I know that data is one of those big questions, especially in social sciences, because uh, social sciences uh, don't necessarily consider what the definition of uh, the official definition of what research data is is not necessarily the same in in other fields. And um, just to give a, a short answer, data is anything that uh, is required for you to uh, do your research. So it could be a picture, it could be just a word in, that you are using in a in a text. It can be anything really, interviews. So you can have different types of data. You can have the audio recording that is one type of data, but the transcript is another type of data. You might not share the audio, but you might share the transcript, so the, the, the text version. Um, so you might um, edit that to remove any personal data. So that's an edited version of the transcripts. So again, uh, that's um, a different type of, of data that you, you might share. So when sharing data, you don't need to share everything. It's share anything that is relevant for, that might be reusable by others. And in your DMP, you definitely have to write all those different forms. So you would definitely say, I'm recording audio, and then I transcribe it as text. So we'll have a MP3 file, and then I will have a TXT file, and then I will have a CSV file. So you have to really go into details of all the different steps that you go uh, for in when managing your your data um so we have another two minutes uh, any of the questions that we didn't answer i'll uh, i'll uh, do um, a blog post with uh, the the q a um Projects often have their own websites. We end up not being linked to any of these repositories and just containing hyperlinks to them. Is there any best practice on how to connect them? Do these repositories have any API to embed information on the website? So there's two elements. The On the element of the publication you on data, you always get a, a DUI. So never share uh, the, the hyperlink, always share the, or any, 
usually it's a DOI for as personal identifier. Sometimes it's a handle, sometimes it's a, it's another type of personal identifier, but always share that because that can change, but uh, the, the hyperlink behind can change, but the, the DOI will never change. So always, even on uh, Twitter or any other social media, don't share the hyperlink, always share the, the DOI. It's, that's a best practice. Now, in terms of the website of the project, then that I would say is a developer element that you might need to consider actually during the grant proposal of, uh, I'm not a IT expert, so I, I can't answer that question in, in, in detail, but it might be relevant to have someone who is uh, um, IT expert look at to how to make it uh, uh, linked to how to use the API from Zenodo, for instance, or the API from uh, OpenAI Explore, because OpenAI has uh, what's called the OpenAI Graph, which is basically this uh, giant infrastructure that basically gathers all the, the data and interconnects them, and that has an API. So you can um, uh, request information from, from that and connect it directly to your website. But that's specific to the project, that's specific to the website. So that's more on the project side of building the, the website. I don't know if you, Victoria, has have a best practice in, in that uh, regard. So, no. no. <laughs> Sorry. Or uh, also has uh, an API, if I'm not mistaken. So you can also yes. query that. Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes, that it does. Yeah. So you can automatically query per project directly on on your um, on the project side. Um, and so just to finish the because that's actually not a, a question uh, and it's the time. But amazing Q and A. Looking forward to typeset using the the recording. So thank you a lot. So that's a nice way to finish the uh, uh, the webinar. Thanks again uh, to you, Victoria, for for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan, and Open Air. <laughs> And uh, again, we always open for for questions, for feedback, and uh, yes, um, looking forward to uh, good luck with all your projects, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you again if you do join us uh, again. And thanks again. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>